Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and in each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators at the forefront of medical research, practice, and empowering you with knowledge and inspiration, aiding you on your journey to optimal health. Hey guys, it's out. You've probably heard me say this now if you've been watching my podcast, but my documentary, which has been many years in the process, is now available streaming online at drpatientmovie.com. It has been a joy and a treasure and a little bit terrifying to share this very, very intimate personal journey with you. And I hope you'll go share it with friends and inspire someone that you love. Today, I've got a special guest, um, Dr. Brian. He is an international expert on nitric biochemistry, and molecular medicine. He has more than 20 years in academic research leading to many seminal discoveries and has, and this has resulted in dozens of issued U.S. and international patents. Today, we're going to quiz him on this absolutely, I think, cutting edge, such important topic of nitric oxide. If you don't know much about it, stay tuned. We're going to dive in. Products from his innovations are the most successful nitric oxide products in the market and responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue around the globe and most importantly, improved patient health. Welcome, Dr. Brian. So glad you're here today. Hi, Dr. Jill. So good to be with you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And before we dive into nitric oxide, which I just dove into last fall, I gave a presentation and I really started to dive into, especially for women of menopausal age, which is yeah. me. <laughs> Oh, and we'll dive into that. But I always love to know, what's your background? How did you get into the science of nitric oxide? Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, you know, I was introduced to the science of nitric oxide in the late 90s, early 2000s. I was a student at LSU School of Medicine. Uh, I was working on a PhD in molecular and cellular physiology, and a Nobel Prize had just been awarded for the discovery of nitric oxide. And Lou Ignaro, one of the gentlemen who shared the Nobel Prize, came to LSU School of Medicine and gave a talk and you know, had a chance to have a conversation with him. I went and had dinner with him that night. And, you know, I was fascinated by this molecule. So, you know, there was a, a pharmacologist at that school and I trained under him, Martin Felish, who yeah. had been in the nitric oxide field for, you know, 20 years prior to that. And so my, really my work was trying to figure out how do we detect this gas? Because nitric oxide is a gas, it's naturally produced in the body. And once it's produced, it's gone in less than a second. And at the time, you know, 25 years ago, there were no sensitive and selective methods to detect this gas at physiological levels. So that was really the basis for my PhD work. How do we create a detection method where we could detect physiological amounts of nitric oxide in blood, in tissue, in saliva, in biopsies? And so we figured that out. We developed the, the methods and the analytical tools to do that and really create a fingerprint of NO biology in many different diseases from cardiovascular disease to diabetes, ischemia, reperfusion injury, uh, stroke, brain injury. And that really armed us with, with tools and techniques where we can answer a, a, really a lot of 
important biological questions in, in science and medicine. So, you know, we started publishing 10 to 12 papers a year. You know, I finished my PhD in less than two years because we'd, you know, solved them really some major problems in, in diagnostic and nitric oxide biochemistry. And then I went to Boston, trained as a cardiology fellow in Whitaker Cardiovascular Institute for two years. And then I joined the faculty of UT Medical School in Houston as a professor of molecular medicine. Uh, and Fred Murad, one of the other guys who won the Nobel Prize, was my department chair. So he recruited me to wow. join the faculty. We had a drug discovery program. So really, since day one, our whole mission has been to understand the mechanism of disease to the extent that we could fix it and develop rational therapies. And we've we've come a long way because nitric oxide really is fundamental to many chronic disease processes. And so it's it's really foundational. You know, as you know, as a physician, there's many things you got to kind of see through and diagnose and get to the root cause. But what we're finding is nitric oxide deficiency is really one of the earliest signs of, of the onset and progression of chronic disease. Yes, that is why I am here and so absolutely delighted and honored to have you as a guest because I really, again, as I dove in, I was like, wow, this is the biggest discovery that no one's talking about, right? And in medicine, I went to medical school 20 years ago and there was no discussion of nitric oxide, probably because what was the year that it was actually really discovered and you started publishing? Well, the molecule was actually discovered in 1987. It was the first kind of seminal paper showing that this endothelium derived relaxing factor that was this discovered in the 1980s, was nitric oxide. So from 87, kind of its discovery, a Nobel Prize was awarded in 1998. So now we're 26 years post Nobel Prize and, you know, close to 200,000 scientific papers published on nitric oxide. But, you know, even when I was a professor of medicine and taught in medical schools, you know, I, I taught, there was one course that we taught and it was the molecular basis of cell signaling. But it was only the MD PhD students, and I taught that course, and I think that was the only mention of nitric oxide through the entire medical school curriculum. There's a little bit of mentioning in in you know first year physiology courses, maybe a little bit in pharmacology when you talk about PD5 inhibitors and organic nitrates for ischemic heart disease, but that's it. But it's so fundamental to to medicine that you know it's very difficult to change the curriculum in, in medical schools and how we train future physicians. Yeah, you know, this is kind of a pattern. Again, we have amazing medical system in the U.S. and we have wonderful training, but often if there isn't a blockbuster drug that is related to the concept <laughs> or if there isn't a, a financial reason to really promote it. Now, again, this is just so core to so much physiology. I think one of the things um, that really surprised me was, and um, you can correct me if I have the stat wrong, but I think I heard over the age of 40, we have about 50% production of nitric oxide. And over the age of 60, it might be more like 15%. Um, and yeah, so tell us how, why, as we age, to me, this is like one of the core foundational concepts of anti-aging, right? Like how do we make more nitric oxide naturally? That's right. Well, if you look at the population, kind of the general population, right? And look at age dependent loss of nitric oxide, and really what we're determining is endothelial dysfunction. So the, the endothelial cells are the cells that line all the blood vessels. There's an enzyme contained in the endothelial cells called nitric oxide synthase. When that enzyme becomes uncoupled and dysfunctional, then that's really the basis for endothelial dysfunction. So the older we get, the less we make. And there's this age-related decline. So, you know, 10 to 12% reduction per decade. So by the time you're 40 or 50, you know, on average, you have about 50% of the less nitric oxide. But you know, that doesn't have to be the case because we figured out how to prevent that age-related decline. And we, we can cer certainly accelerate it by the Western lifestyle. So we're seeing 20 and 30-year-old young men, young women with the vascular age of a 60 or 70-year-old. And, you know, I'm the exact opposite of that. I turned 50 in November, but I've got the vascular age of a 32-year-old. So we can certainly slow that progression and at best case scenario, prevent that age-related decline. But it's things like a sedentary lifestyle. It's the standard American diet. It's exposure to things like herbicides, pesticides, glyphosate, um, you know, basically all the standard cardiovascular risk factors lead to this kind of dose dependent or stepwise reduction in nitric oxide production. Oh, gosh, I have so many questions for you. So this is, again, it's so relevant whether you're listening, you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it's relevant to every single one of you out there. Maybe we go back to that. It's, it's a fascinating story of how we make nitric oxide and why the microbiome of even the mouth matters. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start with a story there and tell patients, what people listening, why that is such a big deal and why, like the uh, pesticides in our food, could affect 
the mouth and could affect production? So that when, when I got started in this field, there was one primary pathway for the production of nitric oxide, and that was the, the nitric oxide synthase enzyme. It's found in our endothelial cells, it's found in neurons, and it's expressed by our immune cells. And it's, it's, it's responsible for killing bacteria and viruses or any pathogen. But this is, a as a biochemist, this is an energetically and kinetically unfavorable reaction. So my whole thought process, trained in biochemistry and physiology, is there's enormous redundancy in the human body right? There's always a backup compensatory system. And if nitric oxide was this critical fundamental molecule that we all thought it was, why is there only one pathway to make it? And why is that pathway so damn complicated biochemically? And now fast forward, now we know that the microbiome, the bacteria that live in and on our body, part of their job and role is to produce nitric oxide. And it does this through, you know, inorganic nitrate that's found primarily in green leafy vegetables, they metabolize this into this two electron reduction to inorganic nitride, and then we swallow it and we make nitric oxide in the lumen of the stomach. And so the bacteria, the oral bacteria are absolutely essential for this, this pathway because humans do not have this enzyme. We, we lack a functional nitrate reductase enzyme. And so when you think about things we do on a daily basis, like mouthwash use, two out of three Americans use mouthwash every day, and two out of three Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. And we and others have published that that's not coincidental, it's causal. And then things like fluoride, you know, fluoride's an antiseptic, it's, it's a neurotoxin and it shuts down your thyroid function. So when we start to understand how do we improve and support the diversity of the microbiome and then eliminate things that destroy it or disruptive, then we can start to imp improve this ecology, improve nitric oxide production. And we're starting to see, you know, remarkably, we can reverse resistant hypertension and actually get people off of antihypertensive anti medications because what we're finding in a lot of cases, patients with resistant hypertension, their hypertension is a consequence of oral dysbiosis. Wow. So the ARBs, the ACE inhibitors, the calcium channel antagonists aren't going to normalize the blood pressure because it's not a renin-angiotensin problem. It's not a calcium mobilization issue. It's an oral dysbiosis. So if you, if you, if you, interrogate your patients, say, are you using mouthwash or fluoride in your toothpaste? Two out of three people say yes on the mouthwash, Not 10 out of 10 people say yes on the fluoride, and they go, okay, do me a favor. Stop using mouthwash, get rid of fluoride, give me 30 days, and let's come back and we'll test your blood pressure. And remarkably, it's, it's, it's somewhat normal. I mean, that's remarkable that you can just support the microbiome, improve nitric oxide production, and normalize your blood pressure. Yeah, this was one of my massive ahas when I did the research. I thought, because I was still using mouthwash, not maybe your conventional, even your natural, but it doesn't matter if you're destroying the microbiome with antiseptics. That was a massive aha. So for those patients, for people listening, uh, let's go to this mechanism. Basically, nitric oxide is a vasodilator, right? It opens it. Okay. Things to, so if you have this constriction and you have lack of nitric oxide, that's one of the drivers of blood pressure to rise. What percentage would you say are people related to this? Is it a hundred percent? Is it 80%? Is it because obviously there can be kidney issues and other issues. Yeah. What percentage would you say is related to <clears throat> nitric oxide production at some level for blood pressure issues? Well, I think it's probably 95% of essential hypertension is, is law is related to a loss of nitric oxide production because it's, it's, it's about, vascular reactivity and regulating blood flow and vasodilation. And, and so blood pressure control is a balance between vasoconstrictors and vasodilators. And nitric oxide is the primary vasodilator. So if you lose the ability to produce nitric oxide, the vasoconstrictor effects take over the vasoconstrictors. And now you're pumping the same volume of blood through smaller pipes. And as a consequence, you see an increase in pressure. So if we can just restore the production of nitric oxide, and, you know, it's the ACE2 inhi in inhibitors, you know, that has a nitric oxide effect because it, you know, down regulates the ACE2 receptors. Um, and so there's always a crosstalk in that. And so it, it may not be a renin-angiotensin problem. Again, it, it, but if we can just provide nitric oxide, restore endothelial function, then, you know, not only do we, do we improve the vasodilatory capacity of the blood vessels, but you actually improve compliance of the blood vessels. So now with each heartbeat, you can dampen that pulse response and lead to less damage to the endothelial cells. Yeah. And I want to get real because many of you who have blood pressure issues may not feel it and you may kind of not care because you don't feel differently. 
But if you're a man who has sexual dysfunction or a woman who is anorgasmic, has trouble with orgasm or, or even um, activation of lubrication and all those things, these things, which people do care about, right? They're very <laughs> related to nitric oxide as well. Do you want to just comment on why it's so important for men and women for normal sexual function to have good nitric oxide production? Because this is where people, it matters, right? <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, I see people all the time and, you know, they're at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and, you know, they don't pay attention to it. But once they start to develop sexual dysfunction, then it becomes a crisis. Yes. Get their <laughs> so attention. Then, then that pays their attention. So look, it's all about regulation of blood flow. So to, di to, to get an erection in men or women, you have to have dilation of the blood vessels. And that dilation is dependent upon the blood vessels supplying that sex organ to be able to produce nitric oxide. Without nitric oxide, there's no dilation, can't get engorgement. And in men, it, it leads to sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction. But it's the same thing in women. You know, you have to dilate the blood vessels of the clitoris and you've got to, for women to become orgasmic, you got to see an increase in labial pressure, clitoral pressure. And that pressure comes from an increase in blood flow, which is due to nitric oxide production. So if there's no nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessels, there's no dilation, there's no engorgement, there's no increase in pressure and you cannot reach orgasm. So it, and it, we call that the canary in the coal mine, because if you have vascular dysfunction in the vascular bed of the sex organs, it's not just isolated there. It's systemic. It's in your coronary arteries. It's in your cerebral arteries. It's in your pulmonary arteries. So it's, it's systemic disease that you have to pay attention to and correct, or else that sexual dysfunction is going to lead to advanced coronary artery disease, heart attack, stroke, and you become a statistic. But we can avoid that. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein Barr, and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Yeah. And I love what we're talking about this because obviously it gets people's attention, but more importantly is what you said is this is a signal that there's endothelial dysfunction in your body. So again, if you're a woman or a man who's having trouble and this can come as early as thirties or even, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's surprising to me how many people early in life are starting to have dysfunction and it's a signal that they're going to be, um, if they don't, address this issue, they're going to have issues. And if the sexual dysfunction didn't get your attention, let's talk about the brain, because again, people are thinking yeah. about the heart and the blood pressure, but this is absolutely critical to blood flow to the brain. Talk a little bit about cognition. Is there any relation to studies with, with uh, dementia or cognitive decline and nitric oxide? Absolutely. So again, it's in, if you look at the work of Daniel Lehman and you look at spec scans of the brain, whether it's functional MRI or spec scan, really what we're looking at in those imaging modalities is how well perfused the brain is or, or an organism. In this particular case, it's the brain. So in any neurocognitive disorder, whether it's mild cognitive disorders, vascular dementia, Alzheimer's, bipolar, there's always a loss of regulation of blood flow. So there's a vascular component to every disease, including every neurological disease. But in terms of cognition and dementia and the progression of Alzheimer's, it's called diabetes type three, right? So you, it's it's loss of insulin signaling and it's loss of glucose uptake. So when you look at kind of, when you define the disease process of Alzheimer's, it's low blood flow, it's inflammation, oxidative stress and immune dysfunction, and it's insulin resistance. And remarkably nitric oxide, this single molecule addresses every single one of those. It improves blood flow, mitigates the inflammation, inhibits oxidative stress and prevents the immune dysfunction. And based on a paper we published in 2009, nitric oxide is part of the insulin signaling pathway. So it can potentiate insulin signaling, enhance glucose uptake. And now the brain can actually take in an energy substrate where it can do its job. So we, we're developing, we have a drug in, in phase three trials now for Alzheimer's and mild cognitive disorders because, you know, it gets to the root cause of the disease. And, you know, we're up against a, a big hurdle here because all Alzheimer's drugs have failed. Yes, And I think they've all failed is because these companies are going after the wrong target. 
they're targeting the amyloid and the, the plaque and the tau tangles. And those are consequences of the disease. They're not the cause of disease. What we're doing is getting to the root cause of disease. And I think this is going to be a game changer for, for Alzheimer's and, and vascular dementia. Wow, I can't wait to see that because you're right at the core. I mean, and especially let's just shift just a little bit more into the post pandemic because this particular virus we've been dealing with has a pretty dramatic effect on the endothelium. And for me, I'm now considering COVID an endothelial disease, right? And so we're right. seeing a lot more patients post COVID, long COVID, and it's all about the endothelium. Where do you see in your research this being connected? Because I feel like as we restore that nitric oxide and that healthy endothelial lining, we get resolution of long COVID and post COVID kinds of symptoms, right? Yeah, no doubt. Really, we've learned a lot over the past four years on kind of the vascular complications of COVID. And in fact, we, we had a drug in phase three trials for COVID early on in, in 2020, because what we were finding was that the people who were getting sick and dying from COVID were the people who could not make nitric oxide, wow. the elderly, the people with a prior heart attack, diabetics, smokers, African-Americans. So these are the people who clinically present with nitric oxide deficiency. And so in 2005, it was published that nitric oxide actually prevents the coronavirus from replicating. And that was SARS-CoV-1. This was SARS-CoV-2. So if you can't make nitric oxide, then you get an upregulation of adhesion molecules. You get the ACE2 receptor, which is the primary target of the, the spike protein. So now you've got multiple targets being expressed for this virus to attach to. <clears throat> and if you have uh, nitric oxide deficiency, you can't mobilize an immune response. So now the virus goes into the cell, hijacks our DNA, replicates, propagates throughout the body. And then it allows for the platelets and monocytes and neutrophils to stick to the lining of the blood vessels. You get microclots, and there's the vascular inflammation from long COVID. So well, our approach was, well, let's give nitric oxide to these high-risk patients. That way you can, number one, prevent the virus from replicating. Number two, nitric oxide downregulates the ACE2 receptor, so there's less target for the virus to bind to. And you basically completely uh, mitigate the vascular inflammation from the spike protein, you completely detoxify it. Wow. And so that's been our approach and it worked well. I mean, we were keeping patients out of the hospital, but as you know, COVID changed, the virus mutated and it became a you know a moving goalpost. So there were no way we were ever gonna reach our, our clinical endpoints because everything was changing. Okay. And, exactly. and now we know that it was a political, it was, yeah. there was a lot of politics involved in the, in the COVID virus. So, uh, you know, but what we did was we established safety. We treated over 600 really sick, yeah. highly medicated patients, and there was not a single safety signal with our nitric oxide therapy. So now we're moving straight into phase three trials because we've, we've established safety for our drug programs. Absolutely amazing. And um, let's talk briefly about the products you developed, because we're going to mention that. And if you guys want to check that out, we'll give you links in the um, show notes. But the N101, is that a, your brainchild and your research? And, and it sounds like you've got some pharmaceuticals, but also there's these, tell us about the different categories and um, what you've got. Well, I'm, I mean, my objective early on was, as I mentioned, to develop safe and effective drug therapy. And, you know, but what we're doing is completely different. Most drug companies employ the principles of pharmacology, right? Create a synthetic compound that inhibits a biochemical reaction and to treat a symptom or a consequence of some biochemical reaction. What we do is completely different. We employ the principles of restorative physiology. And as it relates to nitric oxide, what we're finding is that most chronic disease is associated with a loss of nitric oxide. So what we wanna do is figure out what's missing and give back this missing molecule at doses that recapitulate endogenous signaling and endogenous production. And that's restorative physiology. And what we're finding is there's really not any indication where nitric oxide at the right dose at the right time in the right patient wouldn't be beneficial. But as you know, it takes many years and tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to get a drug approved and on the market. So what we did early on is we, we developed over-the-counter dietary supplements because we're basically restoring the function and supporting the structure and function of the human body. We can do that through nitric oxide. But the challenge in really for the past 40 years is how do you deliver nitric oxide gas in an outpatient setting? Yes. The only way you do it in a, in a clinical setting is through a nasal cannula. And this is approved for premature babies with pulmonary hypertension or adults undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass to maintain some tissue oxygenation. But it's a gas. So, you know, what we did, what my claim to fame is I made the first and only solid dose form of nitric oxide gas. So we do this through an orally disintegrating tablet. You put this lozenge in your mouth and it dissolves over five to six minutes. 
So you just move it around. As it's moving around, it's liberating NO gas. And we can detect it. And we can, through an ultrasound, we can see dilation of your carotids within 10, 12, 15 seconds. So the nitric oxide that we're releasing is vasoactive. And we recouple the NOS enzyme. So we're overcoming and fixing the underlying endothelial dysfunction. We understand the enzymology that we can prevent BH4 oxidation, maintain NOS coupling. And because it's an early disintegrating tablet, what we're finding is that it's killing the pathogenic bacteria in the mouth. Wow. And it's helping to wake up and restore the, the nitrate reducers, the nitric oxide uh, producing bacteria. So if your body can't make nitric oxide, our products do it for you. But more importantly, we fix the reason your body couldn't make it in the first place. And that's what makes our products different than any other product technology on the market in the world. All of the companies are giving you precursors and substrates and they cross their fingers, close their eyes and hopes and prays that your body can convert it. But the basis for patient's deficiency is they cannot utilize those precursors or substrates to make it. And so we have to fix that. And that's what we do. Wow. I'm just in awe because again, I know about some competitors out there and what they claim, but that's one reason I wanted to bring you on and talk to you because I know you are at the forefront of really doing the research and showing and proving. Well, it's it's the source of my daily frustration because in the supplement space, as you know, it's the wild, wild west. Yes. Everybody says the same thing, but very few products actually deliver on that. And nitric oxide is, is a molecule that, as I mentioned, it's a gas, it's gone in less than a second. So you know, a lot of these people, I think, are well-intended. They're just naive on the science and the biochemistry. So, I, and then other people out there are, are intentionally defrauding and deceiving their customers because they know better. But yet, so that's my frustration. That's why I appreciate the opportunity to come and inform and educate on really the science of nitric oxide. I'm not here to sell you products. I'm, I'm here to try to tell you how to fix it naturally. But if you need a little bit of help, then we have products that will certainly help you. Gosh, I love this. So let's briefly talk. There are foods, obviously, leafy greens. This is why every diet that's ever had any good scientific evidence, whether it's Mediterranean or it includes leafy greens at the primary okay. as one of the primary substrates because this is so core, and beets and root vegetables. Do you want to name some of the top food sources of this? It's really the darker the green leafy vegetable, the more the nitrate content is. And I mean, that's just based on this this whole field of agronomy. You know, the plants that are grown in the soil, if we add nitrogen to them, they assimilate nitrogen in the form of nitrate. So the more nitrate, the highly fertilized fields, the greener the, the vegetable. But it's typically, if you look at kale, spinach, arugula, um, you know, beets have become pretty popular over the past 10, 15 years, but beets aren't really the major source of, of nitrate. Um, you know, they're the third least liked vegetable in the world. But, you know, we, we published a paper in 2015 where we looked at the regional differences in the nitrate content of, of common vegetables, broccoli, spinach, celery, uh, lettuce, things like that. And there's as much as a 50 to 100 fold difference in the nitrate content of vegetables grown in New York versus Chicago or Dallas or Los Angeles. So it's it's almost impossible to determine or to know if you're getting enough nitrate from the foods you're eating. But I think what we're finding is that as you mentioned earlier, the Japanese diet, the dietary approach to stop hypertension, the Mediterranean diet, all the nutritional epidemiology on these time-tested and proven dietary patterns can be explained by the nitrate content, the oral microbiome, metabolizing this into nitric oxide gas and dilating the blood vessels, normalizing blood pressure, reversing coronary artery disease, you know, the work of uh, Caldwell Esselstyn and you know, our colleagues like Joel Kahn, who use a plant-based diet for regression of cardiovascular disease. I mean, that mechanism is very well elucidated. It's a nitric oxide related phenomenon. But we're also finding, and, and this is having conversations with Dr. Wesselstein and, and Dr. Kahn, is that some patients don't see the benefit. And so I asked them, are those patients the one that are using mouthwash or are they using fluoride? Because if you don't have the right oral microbiome, yes. you can eat a straight plant-based diet so the cows come home, but you're never going to be able to metabolize this into nitric oxide. You're going to sweat it out, you're going to poop it out, and you're going to pee it out. So now they interrogate their patients. They go, oh, well, maybe that explains the non-responders. And that's really, I think, a, a major step forward in understanding the mechanism and really this whole field of nutritional epidemiology. 
I love this and I'm smiling so big, Dr. Brian, because the 2013 paper was one of the reasons I contacted you. So I grew up on a farm in Illinois and my brothers are now real, I mean, they do thousands and thousands of acres and they've really, um, they have all non-GMO and they have started to do organic, which corn and soybean farms in Illinois, that's not done, right? You know how yeah. that goes. So I'm so proud of them, but obviously we talk, I always talk to my brother. He's like the functional guy of the soils. And, and so we talk about like the nitrogen application and some of these things. So I know enough about that. When I read your paper, the thing that shocked me, and I want to share this and you can maybe clarify is here, like I pride myself in eating almost all organic, right? Mm -hmm. But your paper talked about that organic because of the limitations of applications of fertilizers. And I'd let, I'll let you explain. There was yeah. actually a much lower amount of nitrogen in or nitrates in the vegetables that were organic, right? So then there's this conundrum, what do we do? Um, talk a little bit about that because that was a surprise to me and a pretty big deal for people who are eating all organic. No, I think like it was a it's a jaw dropper for us too because we, we we expected some regional variability just because in you know lightning fixation is what fixes nitrogen in the environment the seventy percent nitrogen in the air into usable forms in the soil so you know this rust belt in the south where a lot of <clears throat> farmland is it's enriched naturally in nitrate because of the lightning storms but and and most people don't understand what organic means right we just were conditioned to eat organic because there's no herbicides or pesticides and that that's a good thing. But to get an organic label in the U.S., there's restrictions on adding standardized nitrogen to the soil. You can add manure, uh, compost, things like that. But again, there's no standardization of the nitrogen in the, that compost. So I think what we have to do, and you know, I live on 800 acres here in Texas where we raise our own beef, we grow our own vegetables. So we, what we do is I do soil samples. I figure out what's missing from the soil, and then I add back to make sure it's a nutrient-dense soil. And then I grow the vegetables, but I don't add the herbicides or the pesticides. So what we're getting are nutrient dense foods. They're not, you know, labeled as or, or, or formally organic because we're adding nitrogen and other nutrients to the soil. But what you get is an enormously nutrient dense food that's free of chemicals. So I tell people, you know, go to your local farmer, go to your local market, get to know your farmers. Even if you live in big cities, there's still people out there that are growing you know, good food, free of toxic, uh, free of uh, herbicides or pesticides, but understand how to grow food, add nitrogen, and how to assimilate all these nutrients uh, into the foods we eat. And I think that's a, it's a major problem. Yeah, that's what I loved reading about that because I read about your farm and about and I just was so fascinated because my brothers and my dad are still doing that. And the same thing, they're testing every soil and they're really mm -hmm. adding back just, and we always talk about the deficiencies in the humans and like magnesium in the soils used to be very prevalent. Now I think it's about a fifth or less of the magnesium. So people are like, well, why do I need supplements? But if you're not getting, even if you're getting a good organic product that has a, a soil depletion, and I've been talking to Jeff Bland lately about, I think mm -hmm. soils are the new, we used to say the gut is where autoimmunity and disease starts. Well, now I think it's the soils, right? And I'm sure you would agree. Sure. The soils are where the disease really starts because we're getting deficient products. And um, gosh, this is fascinating because I could talk all day and I'm not- You know, there's, there's data now going back to the 1940s and tracking just the basic micronutrients in the food grown in America. And there's a 78% decline in basic micronutrients like magnesium and selenium and chromium in the foods that were grown in the 1940s up until 2017. So this, this pressures of feeding a growing population is at the expense of nutrient density. Yeah. And so it's a major problem. So I tell people, you almost have to supplement because we're not getting the nutrients from the foods we eat. And I think that's why micronutrient analysis and personalized medicine is so important because, as you know, there's not a one size fits all. You have to personalize these, these supplements and nutrients and figure out what is the body missing or what is the body exposed to? And then you got to detoxify that. And when you get, replace missing nutrients and you remove from the body toxins, then the human body heals itself. And that's, and I think, you know, after watching your documentary, that's certainly your philosophy. And I think that's why you've changed so many people's lives because you get to the basic principles of, of physiology. And I think we've lost that in medicine because medicine originally was applied physiology. Today it's applied pharmacology. And obviously that's not making anybody better. <laughs> What, what a brilliant statement in that sense, because you're right, it is. And we do micronutrient testing all the time. And I'm always shocked at even like a seven-year-old will come back with all kinds of mineral depletions at that young age. And it's probably from the womb because the mother wasn't depleted, repleted in nutrients. 
Um, so there's a lot of products out there, like we said, that really aren't doing the trick. And for years and years ago, um, there was, you know, like arginine and precursors there. Yeah. Can you guys talk about those? Because there's a couple pathways. And to me, that is just way less effective and, and maybe very problematic, may actually cause more harm than good. Right. Maybe just share, because I know we have a lot of practitioners listening and they're looking at their bottles of what they're using. I want them to know why that this N101 may be a better option. Well, arginine, so the, the nitric oxide synthase enzyme, the enzymology of that takes arginine and through a five electron oxidation produces nitric oxide. And then you get a byproduct, L-citrulline, as a, as a consequence of that. So L-citrulline is a byproduct. So the, the binding constant, and we call this the Michaelis constant in biochemistry, the, the concentration needed to theoretically saturate 50% of the binding sites for arginine is five micromolar. But even in the sickest of sick patients, intracellular and plasma levels of L-arginine are, are 100 to 200 micromolar. So 20 to 40 to 50 times higher than what's needed to theoretically saturate the binding side of the enzyme. So the whole point is you're never deficient in L-arginine. So giving L-arginine doesn't fix the problem. You've, it's like putting gas in a car with a blown up engine, right? You're not out of fuel. The enzyme to convert the arginine to nitric oxide is what's uncoupled and dysfunctional. And now there's data showing that if you give L-arginine to a patient with endothelial dysfunction, either post-infarct patients or PAD, they actually get worse. Post-infarct patients actually had a higher mortality. PAD patients, intermittent claudication got worse. Quality of life got worse. So L-arginine is contraindicated in post-infarct patients and patients with peripheral heart disease. But the common denominator in post-infarct and PAD patients is endothelial dysfunction. So arginine and citrulline, you're never deficient. There's never a reason to supplement. And so I tell people all the time, those, and plus your body makes arginine and, and citrulline through the urea cycle. It's a semi-essential amino acid. You get it from the breakdown of proteins, but it's produced in sufficient flux through the urea cycle, which is the partial urea cycle, which is present every cell in the human body. Uh, so you always have a constant flux of arginine. So you no need to take arginine products. So save your money. Uh, they don't work. I mean, they may, let me let me make a comment. They may provide other benefits, but it's not a nitric oxide benefit. And a lot of these companies are putting arginine with a bunch of resveratrol, antioxidants. They contain a lot of good ingredients. They're just not a nitric oxide product. So call it a multivitamin. Don't call it nitric oxide. Love it. And I couldn't agree more. And thanks for, like I said, you bring the science to this at a great level. Um one thought is, well, I've got a couple of things going on here in my head. One is mast cell activation. I did some research and read that this can actually, nitric oxide can actually help the mast cells and the gut lining, especially, which gut is a lot of times where there's inflammation, dysfunction happening. You, do you want to talk a little bit about what nitric oxide might have to affect the leaky gut and permeability, mast cell activation? Well, it's the same in endothelial cells or epithelial cells. We have to maintain that barrier function. And part of that intracellular communication, nitric oxide is one of these intracellular signaling molecules. So whether it's, you know, endothelial cells and the, you know, where you got the tight junctions in the brain, where you got the fenestrations in the liver, you know, there's different types of vascular beds and different organ types. But in terms of leaky gut, you know, when you lose that barrier function and then, you know, peptides and undigested fragments start going, leaking across the gut and your body develops an antibody against it and foodborne allergies and autoimmune disease, then we've got to fix that. Right. So I think number one, I think what you preach is when you have to figure out what is the offending agent? Is it gluten? Is it dairy? Is it some other foodborne allergen? Is it exposure to some chemical? Um, but then you've got to support that. And what we're finding is that the microbiome, the gut microbiome is extremely important in that communication. And so not only the epithelial cells producing nitric oxide, but the bacteria in the distal colon are also part of this to maintain that, that uh, epithelial uh, barrier and maintaining that function. So what we're finding is nitric oxide can kind of mitigate that inflammatory response, but until you remove the offending agent, you've got this chronic inflammatory cycle. And, you know, I think in 2004, we published on this in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, because if you look at the literature, people go, oh, well, nitric oxide is always present in UC patients and, and colitis. So nitric oxide is contributing to the pathology, but that's not the case at all. You know, I tell people that cops always show up at a crime scene but the cops didn't cause the crime. They're there to kind of, you know, prevent further damage from death. And in this paper in 2004, we published that in, in Crohn's patients, they've got chronic inflammation in the gut. And so you're getting this overproduction of nitric oxide to kind of suppress the inflammation, but it leads to a, a feedback inhibition on the constitutive isoforms. 
So people with chronic inflammation, even though they may have a local overproduction of nitric oxide at that site, whether it's in the gut and, and uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, the endothelial production of nitric oxide is completely shut down. And now they have systemic inflammation, they have runaway oxidative stress. So if we can restore the production of nitric oxide, you actually mitigate the inflammation, inhibit the oxidative stress, and basically heal the gut. But again, you have to identify what, what was the offending agent in the first place. Wow. You just read my mind because my next question was going to be in these super complex chronic, especially like POTS dysautonomia, where they're actually yeah. hypertensive and they're having this runaway activation. And I and I wanted to understand, I know they need nitric oxide, but sometimes in the acute phase, they're actually producing too much locally, which is what you just explained. So would there be any contraindication? Say someone runs a blood pressure 90 over 60 and they're really having POTS dysautonomia. Is there any way to take your kinds of uh, products and supplements that would be safe or would you avoid it for a certain time? Talk about that kind of patient. Yeah, you know, dose dictates poison, right? And so they're, they're, the, the only toxicities of nitric oxide are hypotension and then methemoglobinemia. Yes. So what we, and we tested this before we ever brought these products to market, because if you have low blood pressure, normal blood pressure, the last thing you want to do is further reduce blood pressure right. Right? and cause syncope and people right. pass out. That's not a good, good response. But what we're finding is, and we've done this through 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And we, you know, for example, I'm always the, the N equal one experiment or the guinea pig. Me too. <laughs> my, <laughs> that's very important, right? We have to test it. So my blood pressure is, you know, 116 over 72. I take a lozenge, there's no drop in blood pressure. And then if you take people with POTS or, you know, chronic hypothyroidism with blood pressure, you know, 90 over 60, there's no further reduction in blood pressure. But what we're finding is, and in, in these pediatric patients that we published on, you know, we can take blood pressure of 200 over 110 in four hours, bring it down to 130 over 80. Wow. But it's a safe, steady decline in nitric oxide production where there's no orthostatic hypotension. So the, to answer your question, there's really been no, no person, no contraindication where we would see the nitric oxide that we're producing through this lozenge where it wouldn't be beneficial. You know, so uh, there's no unsafe drop in blood pressure. There's certainly no med hemoglobin formation uh, when taken as instructed. Uh, so, but you'll you'll develop low blood pressure long before you develop any cyanosis from the med hemoglobin. Oh, that makes so much sense. Because for me, it's been understanding, um, and maybe you can clarify too, there's an ENOS and an INOS, right? And they're a little That's bit right. different. Do you want to just explain those two? Because I think one can be activated with inflammation and the other is the endothelial, right? The ENOS. Yeah, so there's two, what we call constitutive isoforms. There's the neuronal NOS that's found in the neurons of the brain. Then there's the ENOS, which is found throughout all the blood vessels. So those are constitutively expressed, meaning they're, they're constantly active. They're producing nitric oxide at any given time. The inducible is only, in, it's induced from a cytokine storm. So when we see an infection or yes. see an injury, then this cytokine, four hours after we see that injury, there's an upregulation of this INOS enzyme. Now that enzyme produces about a thousand or 10,000 times more nitric oxide than the constitutive isoforms. So what it does is it goes and if it's an infection, then that overproduction of nitric oxide binds to the iron sulfur centers of the bacteria and completely shuts down the respiration. So it kills the bacterial infection and it prevents the virus from replicating. And it's not just the coronavirus, it's, it's RSV, it's the seasonal flu, it's any respiratory virus, it's any virus for that matter, it doesn't have to be respiratory. But it also kind of walls off the, the the site of infection or the injury. And that's the, you know, the the redness, the heat, you know, all the, the hallmarks of inflammation. So the local inflammatory response is absolutely essential for mitigating infections and for the wound healing response. Now, the problem is when you have chronic inflammation and that system never gets shut off because now it leads to feedback inhibition of the constitutive isoforms. So you've got to remove the offending agent, figure out what's causing the inflammation, and then reset the nitric oxide which is what we do through our technology. We recouple the NOS enzyme and we kind of downregulate uh, the TNF alpha mediated response and all these cytokines. Okay. This is so clarifying. You talk about our N of one experiment, because I do that on myself, right? And you know, a little bit about my history. I had Crohn's disease yeah. at 26 after breast cancer. And now there's this big aha I just had as I'm listening to you speak. Number one, I have a real high risk gene for Crohn's, which is NOD2. And what that means is my um, response to a normal microbiome is incredibly aggressive. And so that kind of makes sense. And then I also have this thing that's very, very unique. And my INOS is very upregulated. I'm like one in a million as far as the amount oh, wow. of INOS, which makes sense, doesn't it? Because 
because what happens in like the Crohn's is my INOS went crazy and was reactive to a normal microbiome after chemo caused more permeability in the gut. And this whole thing started mm, and then, Crohn's, right. It's like so fascinating. Um, and so, and it's interesting because I, that's what I've been trying to understand myself is how do we do this with patients like myself who actually have the INOS out of control. But what you're saying is if we upregulate ENOS and actually correct some of that, that will in improve permeability, improve overall efficacy and decrease that INOS, that kind of um, reaction to infection that's or right. toxin. Yeah, it, it may seem a little bit counterintuitive, right? Especially in that local inflammatory side of the gut. But if we give the nitric oxide, you can kind of downregulate that. But I think more importantly, you restore the constitutive isoforms where you get normal signaling and you basically shut down superoxide production from NADPH oxidase, the electron transport chain, and from an uncoupled NOS. So oxidative stress goes away, you mitigate the inflammatory response, and then you, the body can actually heal. Amazing. That makes so much sense. And it also makes sense because if I have an objective nitric oxide strip on my mouth, it's going to be <laughs> none, right? Yeah. So <laughs> of course, that, would that strip be a test more for the ENOS, the healthy nitric oxide from the bacterial in the mouth versus like an INOS that was, because the INOS is localized to some area of the body, right? So when you sure. test someone's saliva, you're going to actually get probably their well, what we're measuring is salivary nitrite. And so right. what we have to understand is where's that coming from? And really what those test strips are measuring, and I developed those test strips 15 years ago. I don't use them anymore because there's there's false positives. Yeah. So what we're finding is people with active oral infection, it's an INOS mediated response. It's a local immune response yes. to an active oral infection. So they have periodontitis or a cavitation. Yeah, so it has nothing to do with reflection of reflection of systemic nitric oxide availability. It's a it's a diagnostic for poor oral hygiene or periodontal disease or, or either an asymptomatic infection in the oral cavity. So that gives people a soft sense of security because we see, you know, the 50 year old overweight, diabetic, hypertensive patient with ED and he lights up the test strip. We go, what? You have what? all the typical <laughs> symptoms of nitric oxide deficiency, but he's lighting it up. And then you find out, oh, if you do a, a, an oral exam or ask questions, this guy has poor oral hygiene. He's got infections through the roof. And so that's a false positive. And so we just have to be aware of that. I, I love that clarification because, again, those are a dime a dozen now getting out there. People are throwing, you know, handing them out at, at conferences. Yeah. And I, I've always wondered, you know, is this really accurate? And then again, someone like me who has this very rare kind of unique genetics on this, um, that that makes so much sense. You've clarified a lot. So um, obviously your work, I would love to tell people, where can they find more about you, more about your work? You've been such a leader in this industry, and we're so grateful for your research. No, um, thank you. Tell us where the pe people can find you. <clears throat> you know, I send people first. To, I've got a YouTube channel. Uh, we'll do. We'll probably host this or show this podcast on the YouTube. But it's podcast. It's lectures. I've got an educational website, drnathansbryan.com. I do a monthly blog. There's six minute videos on there that'll tell you really everything about nitric oxide. Um, you can find me on PubMed. I've published over 100 peer reviewed papers. If you want to read the published literature. Um, our products are n101.com. That's the letter N, the number one, the letter O, number one.com. I'm on Instagram, Dr. Nathan S. Bryan, Twitter at Dr. Nitric. Um, got a couple books out. I got a new book coming out probably this fall called The Secret of Nitric Oxide, Bringing Nitric Oxide to Life. And it's similar. It's, you know, as, as watching your documentary, <clears throat> Jill, it was really in inspirational. But you know, it's, it's so part, my book is part autobiographical, but also telling the story of the discovery of nitric oxide and why this molecule is so important so that hopefully people can, you know, we can empower people all around the world to understand this molecule and take the steps to, you know, maintain adequate production, stop doing the things that disrupt it, start doing the things that promote it, and they'll see a change in their own health and, and life. So thank you for the documentary and, and for being a source of inspiration. Oh, Dr. Brian, thank you for your work over these many decades, um, because this to me is probably the most important issue in chronic health conditions. I don't think there's anything more important that we could be talking about. And I think a lot of people are still very unaware. Like, I think this podcast will be really interesting to people that don't have any idea that that's the underlying root. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for your research. If you're listening, um, wherever you're listening to this podcast, you will find in the show notes links to Dr. Brian, his research to the N101 site. Um, and just thank you again for coming on, for sharing your wisdom. We'll have to have you back when your book's out because I want to share that as yeah. well.